we have a lively debate. Um, now, it's my distinct honor to invite Dr. Rajendra Pachari to the stage. Dr. Ch Dr. Pachori, who will correct my pronunciation, I'm sure, leads the intergovernmental scientific organization charged with understanding our single greatest resource, our climate. It's, after all, the basis of our security, and any serious deterioration of our climate could destroy all hope of maintaining that security. But it's also the subject of fierce debate between powerful and competing interests. To look at what is happening in this area, I now turn to Dr. Pachari. Well, thank you very much. Let me first say that it's a great privilege to be here and among such distinguished uh, luminaries in the field. Um, when I had the privilege of receiving the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the IPCC, I did use a term in Sanskrit, which is a traditional term uh, called Vasudev Kutumukam, which means the universe is one family. And I think essentially in what I'm going to say in relation to climate change, which is by far the most important uh, global commons that we have, uh, anything that happens in one part of the world has implications for the rest of the world. And that really should bring us to the conclusion that uh, we're all in it together. Now, what I have is a PowerPoint presentation. And let me start with the first slide. Yes, this gives you observations of uh, uh, changes in temperature that have taken place since the beginning of industrialization. And you would observe that there are fluctuations over there. It's not a smooth curve at all. And that's essentially because the climate changes for natural reasons, but now it's also changing increasingly so on account of human factors. And the trend becomes very clear if you look at this line, which is drawn across uh, the past 100 years. Uh, we have seen that the temperature increase, the average surface temperature increase, has been 0 0.74 degrees Celsius during the last century. But if you look at the last 50 years, the slope is much steeper. And this clearly indicates that um, temperatures are changing more rapidly than they did in the past. Um, it's uh, important to note that the rate of change is almost twice in the last 50 years as compared to what it was over the last 100 years. And here may I also say that we, in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, came up with a very clear conclusion that most of the warming that has taken place since the middle of the last century is very likely on account of increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. And when we use the term very likely, we are ascribing a probability of 90% or more. So that, in my view, is a very conclusive uh, uh, finding that I don't think we should ignore. Um, if you look at the rate at which glaciers are melting, uh, this, again, is an issue that has to be treated with seriousness because across the world, you can see the major decline that has taken place um, over the last 50-odd years, and it's quite appreciable. This is important because um, everyone describes glaciers across the globe as the water towers of the world. And I can tell you this is particularly important in South Asia, where we've estimated that about 500 million people in South Asia would be affected as a result of rapid me melting of the glaciers in terms of downstream water supply. And in China, about 250 million people. So that's a large chunk of the global population, which depends to a large extent on water that flows from these high mountains, who would obviously be affected adversely as a result. Um, let me show you how sea level has been changing and the increase in sea level during the last uh, century has been about 17 centimeters which is 
not quite a foot, but pretty close to a foot. And of course, if you're in Washington, D.C., perhaps an increase of a foot in sea level is not going to cause any major problems. But if you're living in the Maldive Islands, then clearly that is a source of enormous concern. As a matter of fact, I remember in 1997, we held a plenary session of the IPCC in the Maldives, and the then President, uh, President Gayoum, stood before us, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, the place where you're holding this session 10 years ago was about a meter and a half underwater because there was a massive storm surge, and with a higher sea level, any such event just gets multiplied if the sea level is higher. So uh, the point I'd like to make is that it's not as though the negative impacts of climate change in respect of sea level rise are going to be felt only when areas get inundated. Uh, the problem starts much earlier, and it would happen even before complete inundation takes place. What's the, uh, what are the projections for the future? Well, we have projected temperature changes where, if I might mention, the darker shades indicate a higher level of warming than the lighter shades. And you would observe that in the Arctic region in particular, you have the darkest shades. And this is clearly an indication of the fact which we all know is now based on uh, very accurate observations. The Arctic is warming at about twice the rate of the rest of uh, the planet. Uh, and we have also projected that by the end of this century, if there's no mitigation that takes place and based on plausible scenarios of what would happen in the future, we could get a temperature increase of anywhere from 1.1 degrees Celsius to 6.4 degrees Celsius. But to be able to focus on two sets of values, one at the lower end and one at the upper end, we've come up with a set of what we call best estimates. At the lower end, this is about 1.8 degrees Celsius, and at the upper end, 4 degrees Celsius. Now, what I'd like to explain to you is that this is clearly an outcome that we need to be deeply concerned about because the impacts of climate change with these levels of temperature increases would be largely negative and perhaps far beyond our ability to be able to cope with them. Uh, and just to deal with some of these impacts, um, yes, le le let me first highlight some of these possible abrupt or irreversible impacts. These are not anywhere in the realm of projections or possible or likely happenings, but these are possibilities. And here may I say that Partial loss of ice sheets uh, on polar land could imply meters of sea level rise because we know that the West Antarctic ice sheet or the ice sheet in Greenland, and Greenland is a place that I've been to, where you really have a huge body of ice, and Greenland, as you know, is the largest island on Earth. Uh, you have about three kilometers of ice over there, and there are major dynamic changes taking place. So it's possible that part of this huge body of ice could collapse and fall into the ocean, which would lead to several meters of sea level rise. And the same possibility exists with the West Antarctic ice sheet as well. But a more um, serious issue of concern is what is mentioned here in the second finding the, we found, for instance, that 20 to 30 percent of species are likely to be at risk of extinction if increases in warming exceed 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. And I mentioned to you that the best estimate we had for projections of temperature increase at the lower end during this century are 1.8 degrees Celsius. If you add to that the 0 0.74 degrees increase that took place in the last century, you're exceeding this range of 2.5 degrees Celsius. So the point I'd like to make is that human society has to take this possible outcome rather seriously because 20 to 30 percent loss of species is something that will have major implications.
I read just a few days ago, as a matter of fact, an observation that in the northeast part of the U.S., where I spend a fair amount of time at New Haven, uh, there's been a complete wiping out of the bat population. Uh, I read this in a news report, and this, uh, um, this explained the fact that with this complete wiping out of bats in that region, it's possible that a number of insects, which could be sources of disease, will multiply rapidly. Because it's well known that a bat normally eats more than its body weight of insects during the course of a day. And if this population is be wiped out, then clearly there's a major impact on this cycle of nature, which could have serious implications. Um, I also want to highlight the fact that the meridional overturning circulation uh, is something that could also be affected with the kinds of temperature changes that are taking place. Um, now, change in climate leads to changes in extreme weather and climate events. In fact, tomorrow we have a press conference uh, because we've just completed uh, a major report, uh, the summary for policymakers of which was released over three months ago. But now the full report is available. Uh, and this has come up with uh, some uh, very profound findings on extreme events and disasters which could be linked to climate change. And we know that uh, there are some extremely important findings which I would like to place before you. Firstly, climate models project more frequent hot days throughout the 21st century. Um, now, uh, heat waves have actually been on the increase, and in many regions, the time between the 20-year unusually warm days will decrease. In other words, those heat waves which currently take place once in 20 years will now take place much more frequently, are taking place much more frequently. Um, we also know that intense tr tropical cyclone activity has increased in the North Atlantic since about 1970. And uh, Hurricane Katrina, I'm not saying was the result of human-induced climate change, but was an occurrence, uh, the likelihood of which is uh, going to increase. Now here may I point out that uh, there are also large monetized losses as a result of events of this nature. In fact, in this special report which we've just brought out, we have estimated that the monetary losses since 1980 have varied from a few billion dollars a year to $200 billion a year, which was in 2005. And that's the year when Hurricane Katrina took place. But it's also true that in most parts of the developing world, we just don't have an accurate fix on these monetary losses, simply because you don't have the insurance systems, you don't have means by which you can estimate uh, how these losses can actually uh, increase or have increased over a period of time. So um, as a result, what we might be getting is uh, a, a very low assessment of the global losses that are taking place economically. Now, in the case of North America, there are some important findings which I'd like to place before you, and these relate to uh, water availability. These also relate to um, sea level rise, and there are parts of the U.S. which would be uh, certainly vulnerable to um, sea level rise. And in several urban centers, we would have infrastructure and human health issues, which will be compounded by other stresses, because there are other stresses, and this is a point that needs to be made. The impacts of climate change will only, not only, will not only uh, create serious problems in themselves, but they would also exacerbate some existing stresses. And wildfire and insect outbreaks, outbreaks are also increasing and are likely to intensify. So these are some specific impacts that uh, need to be considered when we are looking at uh, impacts in North America. But on a more global basis, we have a serious problem in respect of agricultural production. Uh, agriculture yields could decrease 
by about 50 percent as early as 2020 in some African countries as, as a result of climate change and climate variability. Now, this has very serious implications for food security and uh, large-scale malnutrition, which already exists in several parts of the world. And this, may I say, could pose serious security problems. You've seen the global response to the Horn of Africa uh, famine that's been taking place in the recent past. And this is something that the rest of the world cannot remain immune to. There will be serious implications, uh, not only in respect of what happens in those locations, but the possibility of people coming as illegal immigrants, as refugees, and so on in surrounding areas, all of which raises several uh, issues of security. Um, let me also mention the fact that uh, in this special report that we've just brought out, we found that fatalities are higher in developing countries. Uh, so most of the deaths that take place as a result of natural disaster-related deaths, and these are not just climate or weather-related deaths, but, but other natural disasters, uh, the bulk of them take place in the developing countries. And the reason for that is that the extent of exposure, the extent of vulnerability that exists in some of these communities is so high that clearly uh, even uh, an occurrence that could easily be handled in a developed uh, society will cause major havoc in a developing country. Now, these are issues that also need to be taken into account when we're discussing the prospects of security in the future. Uh, and to just give you an indication of some vulnerable populations, um, those regions and communities which are highly vulnerable are ones where we have dependence on climate-sensitive resources. Now, this could be rainfall. You know, if you have agriculture that's largely dependent on rain-fed supply of water, then clearly uh, those whose livelihoods and lives depend on this practice would be seriously affected as a result of climate change. The integrity of key, key infrastructure. Uh, for instance, whenever you have a major hurricane or cyclone in a developing country, you just don't have the transport infrastructure for people to get away. You don't have early warning systems. And what's more, you don't have proper shelters. So therefore, there's a large loss of life and property. And that property, in any case, is generally very flimsy. It really doesn't have the strength to be able to withstand some of these extreme events. And uh, the sophistication of the public health system is a factor. Exposure to conflict is a factor, because if you have existing conflict, then clearly some of the impacts of climate change will only exacerbate the situation. We also know that environmental migration is something that uh, is a reality. If disasters occur more frequently or with greater magnitude, certainly some areas will become increasingly marginal as places to live, so people will move away. Migration and displacement could become permanent with new pressures in relocation areas. And this is particularly true in the case of low-lying areas that are threatened by sea level rise, which includes small island states, it includes uh, low-lying coastal areas, and so on. Um, so um, basically, I think we are dealing with situations that are going to be spread across the globe. And um, we need to understand and analyze what the linkage between increasing vulnerability, exposure, or severity and frequency of climate events is in relation to disaster risk. And what you see over here diagram in this diagram is um, uh, an overlap between weather and climate events, the vulnerability of populations. If populations are vulnerable, then certainly the extent of disaster, the damage that takes place is much higher. And of course, the exposure. If the exposure is uh, of a large number of people for a long period of time, then clearly uh, the impacts would be that much more severe. Um, well, uh, there are possibilities by which we can adapt to some of these uh, 
potential situations, these projected occurrences. And here we would need to create capacity by which uh, societies can adapt to some of these particular uh, occurrences. But I do want to highlight the fact that there are tipping points, there are thresholds in social systems, in uh, natural systems, which would really pose very severe challenges to adaptation in some societies. And therefore, I must emphasize the fact that overall, we will have to find ways by which we deal with these risks and these disasters, not only through adaptation, but also mitigating emissions of greenhouse gases globally. Uh, effective risk management and adaptation are tailored to local and regional needs and circumstances. And this is, again, a point that needs to be emphasized, that adaptation and dealing with these risks will require strengthening of local capability and capacity. But of course, as far as mitigation is concerned, this is a global challenge and has to be dealt with on a global basis. I would like to uh, just tell you about some possibilities by which we could uh, minimize the risks by mitigating emissions of greenhouse gases. And this particular chart, where I just want to pick up one number, shows what it would require to stabilize the global mean temperature increase to between 2 degrees and 2.4 degrees Celsius. Well, if we want to do this on a least cost basis, then we have estimated that CO2 emissions globally will need to peak no later than 2015. And if that doesn't, if that's not achieved, then we would deviate from the least cost pathway for stabilization. The other point that I want to make is that even with this degree of temperature increase and the limit that you are able to achieve on it, we would have sea level rise on account of thermal expansion alone of 0 0.4 to 1.4 meters. And this doesn't take into account sea level rise as a result of melting of the bodies of ice. So this, again, is an issue that unfortunately has not been highlighted adequately. Now, there are technological uh, changes that are taking place, which certainly make mitigation technologies far more attractive than they've been in the past. And one example is uh, wind turbines, where if you look back over the last 30 odd years, there's really been a dramatic improvement in technology. Look at the size of wind machines that we started with in the 1980s. They were barely 75 kilowatts each. That was the, the industry average, 17 meters high. And where we're heading now is 20 megawatt machines, which would be much larger than a football field, 250 meters high. And this gives you economies of scale. There are also several other technical features which have been built into some of these machines, and that clearly makes technology an important part of the solutions that we come up with. We have brought out a special report on renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation. And here, even though the world is not spending enough on research and development to bring down costs more rapidly, the fact is that there have been several improvements in costs and cost reductions which are shown and plotted over here. And the good news is that in some applications, renewable energy sources are still uh, are already uh, viable. There's also been a healthy trend towards putting in place policies that would promote renewable energy uh, development and dissemination. And if you look at this picture, which goes back uh, to the year 2004, it shows parts of the world where there were some mitigation and renewable energy policies in place. But if you look at the picture in 2011, the coverage is substantially higher, much more extensive. So I think these are trends which certainly give you some positive uh, feel for where we are likely to go. I also want to mention that uh, we would need to look at the whole process of industrialization in such a way that we minimize our footprint in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I want to end by uh, mentioning the fact that solutions can be achieved by thinking out of the box.
And one particular area where uh, we have, my institute in New Delhi has been able to uh, start on something that is very exciting, is something that deals with the problem of uh, the 1.4 billion people on, on this planet who have no access to electricity. Now, if we wait for electricity to be, to be supplied to them through the conventional means, perhaps three generations would go by. So what we've developed is a set of solar lanterns, which are lightweight, low cost. They use LED lighting systems. And to tell you more about it, I'm going to request that we play the video. But before I do that, let me show you a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, which says, a technological society has two choices. First, it can wait until catastrophic failures expose systemic deficiencies, distortion, and self-deceptions. Secondly, a culture can provide social checks and balances to correct for systemic distortion prior to catastrophic failures. So therefore, I think now that we have the knowledge, we have the foresight to see what would happen or what can happen if we don't take action on time, we have a very strong basis for uh, taking steps by which we can avoid the likely catastrophes that we may have to face in the future. So could we have the video, please? 